Dr. Polk, would you care to discuss your experience with the Cuban Missile Crisis when you were with the Kennedy administration? Yes, sir. Um, in the first day of the crisis, uh, or the first day that we all were fully briefed on the, on the Monday of the crisis week, I was taken to um, the office of the Secretary of State and told that I was to be a member of the three-man uh, crisis management committee that uh, were fully briefed on everything that was happening during the week. And the three of us, uh, Bob Comer in the White House and uh, Bill Bundy in the Defense Department, Bob was uh, Deputy Chief of the National Security Council and Bill Bundy was the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. And I were the three designated members of this committee. And our task was to oversee everything that happened to be sure that nothing, as it were, fell off the table. Uh, everybody's eyes were focused on Cuba, of course, and on uh, the Soviet Union. And our task was to make sure that we didn't overlook anything. Kennedy was extremely concerned as he read uh, various things on the First World War uh, to see how events took hold of the people who were involved and controlled the action rather than the people controlling the action. And uh, so what we were trying to do was to make sure that uh, we all were fully briefed all the time and our task was to alert the Secretary of State or the President uh, or the head of the National Security Council or the Secretary of Defense or all of them indeed um, if we found something that was amiss in the actions that we were taking uh, or something that we were doing that we shouldn't have been doing. And uh, so we were uh, privileged to be three of the approximately 25 or so civilians in the American government who really knew what was happening during the missile crisis. And it was a really quite remarkable experience and, of course, terrifying in many ways because uh, we could see the events leading up to a possible nuclear war. And we were all fully briefed on what a nuclear war meant. Uh, we were all fully cleared for everything the government knew about the Soviet Union or everything we knew about nuclear weapons. So we knew that if we actually did get into a war, we would really be de destroying the world. And it was a, an enormous uh, psychological strain, of course. Uh, I've mentioned um, since, uh, as I look back on that week, by the Thursday of the week, I was absolutely exhausted. And I'm sure that the people who were closer to the action, the President and the Secretaries of State and Defense, were at least as tired and nervous and so forth as I was. I think that's an important thing to mention because um, one of the things or one of the problems that I find in all the literature I've seen since the missile crisis, people seem to regard it as kind of a disembodied uh, set of actions uh, without people being really involved. And if, uh, even the theories of, uh, of um, uh, nuclear uh, confrontation all talk about nations rather than governments being uh, the actors. And of course it isn't governments that are acting, it's people who are acting, it's, it's the individual officials of governments who are making a decision to either go to war or not to go to war. And I'm sure that uh, I was in the, let's say, second or third tier of people uh, from the center um, with the president being the number one tier and the various secretaries being the second tier. And they all were closer to the action than I, but on the Thursday of the missile crisis, I was so tired that at one point, I just for a few seconds or a few minutes, I thought, well, why don't we just get it all over with? It's, uh, we can't stand this any longer. It's, uh, we were moving up to a time when it looked like we had slowly diminish the pressure and then on, by the Thursday the pressure was building up again toward uh, some kind of nuclear confrontation. And it was a, a, a terrifying thought at the time and it's terrified me ever since because I think it's a, it's a fact or a factor of our thinking about nuclear weapons that we neglect the human failabilities involved, that the people involved uh, themselves become part of the, uh, of the danger 
uh, I personally felt this very strongly that um, I snapped out of my feeling, of course, very quickly, but uh, uh, it would have been catastrophic had either Mr. Khrushchev or President Kennedy uh, had the same feelings and not snapped out of it, and, and it just said, okay, let's, let's get on with the situation. And uh, it seems to me that that's something that's enormously important to recognize. And uh, it's something that as, as the missile crisis progressed and as we got into, uh, I want to talk about in a few minutes, the, the uh, aftermath of the crisis when we all gathered, those of us who were involved, to discuss what had actually happened, that we see um, how, to, how close to, to war we really were. Uh, people like um, the then um, man who was the sort of the big bomb man, uh, Albert Wolstetter and uh, Thomas Schelling and people who were uh, the, the theorists of, of nuclear war, it seems to me never really focused on the, the human element involved in the, in the crisis. When you mention nuclear confrontation, do you mean how close we get to nuclear war? And how close do you think we get to nuclear war? during those days? Well, I think we've been much closer several times than we realize. You look back over the, um, the, the history of the Cold War period, uh, these things have tended to be brushed, airbrushed over, if you will. But for example, at one point, um, in the, long before I got into the government, there was an episode where there was a flight of geese that was picked up by radar over uh, Greenland. And um, nobody knew for a few minutes that they were geese. They thought perhaps they were Soviet aircraft coming toward America. And America went to red alert, the top uh, danger signal. And um, quickly, fortunately, they realized that they were just geese. Uh, but uh, there was a, a period uh, of seconds or minutes uh, that might have made all the difference in the world. Then there were two other really very peculiar episodes. Um, one of them, we had a nuclear weapon on an American uh, military aircraft, and it was flying on a training mission down over Florida, and it had engine trouble, and it actually dropped the nuclear weapon uh, on Florida. And the weapon fortunately didn't explode, um, which is in itself a, a peculiar thing because it should have exploded. But uh, it didn't, and um, the, um, the implications of it, uh, of had it exploded, are really quite terrifying. If you can imagine uh, a weapon blowing up somewhere in the Florida Keys, uh, devastating a vast area, uh, wiping out towns and population and so forth, probably that would have triggered um, a response. And once something like that happened, um, it would be very difficult to, to conceive of how it could have been contained. It, it might have been quickly thought to have been a Soviet missile that landed there. And um, one wonders whether all the safeguards and all the things we've talked about would have stopped some kind of retaliatory move. There have been several bombs that have been lost. Uh, the Russians, of course, lost one in the Pacific. Um, and um, um, one of the terrifying things, abstractly, to think about the nuclear arsenal is if you think of anything in which you have thousands, uh, it's so easy to think of how you could even shoes or uh, handkerchiefs or uh, cars or anything else that you couldn't lose one or two of them somewhere along the line. And at that time, if I remember correctly, we had something on the order of 40,000 uh, nuclear weapons in the world. Today it's down to about 10,000, but that's still, um, of course, uh, enormously difficult to think about an inventory of how you control that many weapons. And if I may just push this point a second more, this is one of the things that terrifies me about the, uh, the spread of nuclear weapons around the world, because it's not only the cost of building nuclear weapons and building the facilities that hold them, but it's a matter of maintaining them and keeping them in, in shape and keeping them under control that's terribly, terribly expensive. And you think about the nuclear weapons in poor countries, such as Pakistan and India, for example, 
uh, it's very difficult to think what kind of a strain that is on the national economy and whether they may cut corners on keeping up their nuclear weapons when they need to do other things. They need to build dams, they need to uh, build a ship, they need to do something with the Navy or the Air Force. And uh, unless you've got enormous amounts of money, or even if you do have enormous amounts of money, uh, the process of keeping these things uh, safe is, uh, is itself a huge, huge expense. Well, anything that you do once you have a nuclear weapon, anything that you do to it, uh, disorients or disequalizes its balance in the world system of nuclear weapons. So the Russians uh, reacting to our saying that we want, to we want to modernize our equipment in uh, Germany is to say, well, we will probably have to do the same thing. And since modernizing often means uh, increasing the potential power or uh, uh, changing the trajectory of the weapon. For example, in Europe, we have an arrangement with the Russians uh, to limit the number of long-range missiles. But as the Russians point out, the intermediate missiles that we have in Europe will reach anything in Russia. Their intermediate missiles won't reach anything in America. So there is a disequilibrium in the system already. And if you uh, fiddle around with the capacities of the nuclear weapons that you have in place, then you further disequalize that. And you, you get into a situation where uh, everybody's tense. And that's what you don't want in the world. What we, what we are really facing is a world situation of, uh, uh, as uh, former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara called it, the hair trigger alert. And we don't want hair triggers. We want things that calm things down. That's the same problem uh, of upgrading the missiles as it is spreading them to other countries. And uh, what we need to do is to recognize that missiles anywhere or a danger to people everywhere. I think the Europeans have been, as it were, trained by the last 50 years of experience to uh, recognize that they really can't control what, the, what happens in the, in the uh, weapons of mass destruction field. That's an, uh, an area where the Russians on the one hand and the Americans on the other are totally in control. And I think the Europeans uh, generally have a feeling that uh, somehow that's not in their bailiwick, that they, they can talk about conventional weapons. The problem with, with that approach is that um, if you think of a government um, almost at the point of losing something, losing face, for example, by a military confrontation or being threatened with, um, with defeat, uh, the natural inclination is to go into heavier weapons, and that is to say go into weapons of mass destruction. And uh, the Europeans, it seems to me, have not been aware that if we push, for example, in, uh, in the Ukraine or in northern Russia where we, we've had military maneuvers within um, something like 50 miles of a major Russian base, um, that the danger of of governments reacting, uh, sometimes with false information, sometimes with no information, or sometimes just because they can't afford the the, the cost of, of appearing to their own people, or their, particularly their own military, to be weak and, and unpatriotic. The dangers are very great. I don't think the Americans are even concerned about the nuclear waste we've got scattered around the United States. This is a whole field that I think to the average person just sounds so strange, so bizarre, so something out of outer space that it's difficult for somebody to really think about it. I sit perfectly happily in my uh, library and I think I should be really worried about nuclear weapons somewhere. It seems kind of uh, unlikely. Uh, and of course, the thing that's so hard for those of us who've had this experience with nuclear weapons uh, is that we say to people, my God, you should really be aware of how dangerous it is and how close one can get to a nuclear war. We were so very close during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And in fact, if it hadn't been curiously and ironically for um, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, General Secretary of the Communist Party, um, 
Khrushchev, yes. Uh, uh, if, if Mr. Khrushchev had been clever and not wise, we probably would have had a nuclear war. What he did was uh, he accepted the humiliation of backing down. And um, this, that was another point in, uh, that I think is so rarely understood that um, uh, governments can't, or leaders of governments can't very often afford to do that. He risked a coup d'etat by his own military, and uh, if he'd been overthrown that way, he would have been shot immediately. So in effect, he was having to choose between taking a chance on being shot or, uh, or being irradiated and almost certainly being shot. And he chose the, uh, the brave thing of saying that he would back down. In the legal field in the early 1950s, late 1940s, uh, shortly after the you know, nuclear bombs were dropped on, in Japan, what, what was your interest then, if any, on a nuclear war? Well, like the vast majority of people in this country and in the world, I, I was shocked. By, I was still in the army when the, dog, when, the, when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I was at that time posted to uh, a very small detachment on an island in Boston Harbor called Long Island, not our Long Island, but the Massachusetts Long Island, which uh, was a reception center for German rocket scientists. And that was my last assignment before I was demarbed. And when I think back about it, I, f I find it really difficult to understand that um, so many people in the armed services uh, were thankful for the dropping of the bombs because it ended the war with Japan and as, as a result of what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Japanese finally surrendered and um, they didn't have to go and do what otherwise they would have had to do, namely go and invade Japan and probably lose their lives. And to some extent I was part of that also. You know, they dropped the bomb, you know, great thing. But it wasn't until John Hersey's book came out about the effects of the bombing and how and about these horrible deaths that so many people died because until then you know it's curious because it relates to the way a lot of people are beginning to look at nuclear weapons now at the time we didn't think of them as something totally different from other weapons because of the enormity and the brutality of the damage that they inflicted and the fact that they left behind them after they were dropped the effects of radiation for untold decades or centuries. Well, as I, as I said before, the, the article by Richard Falk, who was also a close friend and, and a great um, progressive international 
law professor at, at Princeton um, in the article, he and his collaborators suggested that the case be taken to the International Court of Justice. And uh, the, um, <coughs> the organization that, that I was asked to head in my spare time the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy was uh, pushing the notion of going to the International Court of Justice, which eventually we succeeded in, in doing. But almost, almost ten years later, but it went to the International Court and they came out with a very good decision. Not perfect, but good in the sense that they ruled that the threat and use of nuclear weapons was generally a violation of international law. But they didn't have enough material at their disposal and the briefs that were filed by about 20 governments to decide whether there was ever a situation where they could be used legally. So they didn't say yes. If they, a yes, Nuclear weapons may be legal in an extreme case. They did not say that, although a, a lot of people misint, uh, misinterpret that decision to mean that they sanctioned the use in extreme cases. What they really said about that was what lawyers call a non-liquid, a, a lack of decision. So, on. On, on, on the possibility of use in an extreme case, they weren't ruling one way or the other. But other than that, this several hundred page decision, one of the most important in the history of the court, was quite clear that they, they were opposed and of the view that international law prohibits the use of nuclear weapons. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you had General LeMay, Curtis LeMay. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, I think everybody should recognize or does recognize how militaristic he was. Well, it is, it is part of official policy now. I'm not sure it was then, but but now you have a president using phrases like fire and fury. Right. So I, I don't think there's there's no doubt in my mind that that if if Trump thinks we can get away with killing a million or two North Koreans without at the same time uh, l losing millions of South Koreans through a nuclear weapons response by North Korea, then, then, then he would he would authorize that. I have no doubt about that. You know, we live in a situation now where a large part of the U.S. population really has no no sense of what a nuclear war would be like. Um, I, saw, I saw a video not long ago where a bunch of students were asked 
I, I don't know by whom, but they were asked what they thought about a nuclear war. And basically what they said was, well, it's just another weapon. And in answer to your question about what should be done, if, if there could be the kind of mobilization against nuclear weapons that there was during the Cold War, I think it would help a lot to make policy makers in Washington uh, abandon this notion that, uh, say, if according to the nuclear posture review that came out a week ago, uh, if uh, the situation now is, yeah, you, you know, we're going to be making smaller nuclear weapons, mini nukes. What's a mini nuke? I mean, is a mini nuke something that only kills a hundred thousand people instead of a million, or a million people instead of ten million? Seems to me that's where we are right now. And, and I don't get the sense that people realize what a, 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 a I, I don't even say what a nuclear incident uh, would do to result in a real nuclear war because the nuclear posture review also now authorizes the use of nuclear weapons against conventional weapons, against cyber attacks. So there is no real policy to stop Trump from ordering a nuclear strike. And you probably know that there are people in Congress trying to get laws passed that would require a number of other high-placed people in the administration to agree to the use of nuclear weapons. But I think that's an insufficient way to deal with it. Because look at this scenario that I'm going to give you. The U.S. gets an order from the president to do fire and fury in North Korea without nuclear weapons, just with the overwhelming capacity that we have with ICBMs and, and other non-nuclear weapons. What is going to be the result? I mean, what's going to be the reaction from North Korea? It's going to be the launch of nuclear weapons against South Korea, possibly against Japan, certainly against Guam, where we have 300,000 people. So the, the, the people in Congress who are working, uh, who have introduced these bills that would restrain to some extent, the use of nuclear weapons by a president acting alone and not looking at this scenario. It shouldn't be the president alone can't start a nuclear 
war. It should be the president alone can't start a war. Well, you asked before, you know, what what can be done. Uh, Cora, my wife, who you know, who was very active in the anti-Vietnam War movement, thinks that we should try to have digitalized teachings. Uh, you know, teachings are very effective in educating people about the war in, in Vietnam. And now we have all of this technology at our disposal. And, and it may be useful to start with some some elementary aspects of nuclear weapons that are not sufficiently known by a sufficiently large group of American citizens. Starting with a question like, what is a nuclear weapon? What is a low-yield nuclear weapon? What is an ICBM? Uh, who has the authority to start a war by any kind of war?